Bergson is not one of those philosophers who ascribes a properly human wisdom and equilibrium to philosophy to open us up to the inhuman and the superhuman durations which are inferior or superior to our own to go beyond the human condition. This is the meaning of philosophy insofar as our condition condemns us to live among badly analyzed composites and to be badly analyzed composites ourselves. The very rules of evil of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is the whole state of things, a pure violence without object and This is the typical violence of Violence because what happens there is a murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins, as always, sponsored by the People's Institute for Revolutionary Semiotics. Before we introduce our discussion today, we just want to mention we've got a Patreon account, patreon.com forward slash M-U-H-H. Consider dropping us a dollar a month there, or if not, maybe leave us an awesome review on iTunes. And, uh, you know, we'll uh, keep our eyes out for it and give you a shout out on the following week's episode. Today, Taylor and I will be taking a look at Deleuze's monograph on Henri Bergson, titled Bergsonism. I think this is my favorite of the monographs that we've tackled thus far, even above and beyond the fold, which I think was my prior favorite, mm. um, you know, I mean, the Kant book is definitely up there as well. But Kant was yeah. nice and short and sweet, right? True. It was like... But it was a nice building block to this because mm-hmm. I think that you know, in particular, in some of the things that Deleuze gets into, I think regarding his critique of dialectics, I think you started to see the like the little germ seed of that yeah. was in the Kant book. While it's on my mind, I just was thinking, you know, I kind of was having this take relative to his critique of dialectic in the sense of my reading was like, if we don't have access to the noumenon, then we are only sort of dealing with these false identities whenever we're doing dialectical analysis, because we're not ever, we're not hitting the real. So that goes to, I think perhaps this possibility of false problems, but (laughs) we'll get to that later on. I just wanted to, Mm -hmm. while I was thinking on it and speaking about the Kant book, that was something that kind of was a little lingering carryover that I picked yeah, up on. Yeah, this question of the true and the false, we've been running this thread at least since we had Vern on for the second time, where he's the one that conjured up one of the monographs we haven't yet gone into, which was uh, Nietzsche and philosophy, where this theme of the powers of the false, you know, rose up and this question of... But in the Hume book, we discussed at length this question of these operative and effective fictions by which we extrapolate and push our reason forward. And so they're not, you know, necessarily opposed to the true in a certain sense. But then in the comp book, as you said, we are dealing within the realm of that which appears. So the status of the true and false becomes much different than, say, it was in classical philosophy, right? Where Kant's at pains to state that, you know, by appearance or appearing, I'm not, you know, by the phenomenal realm, I'm not trying to suggest these are illusory or these are that we're merely in the realm of the false or something. Whereas Nietzsche wants to push that further and topple Kant over and and sort of saying like, well, if we were only left with the apparent world, we actually aren't left with a true world or an apparent world, right? Like the opposition starts to fall although Kant would push back as we kind of showed where he's like that's not what I mean by appearance and Nietzsche's like I don't care anyway with Bergson the true and the false now are no longer about solutions correct solutions like a standardized test and Deleuze brings this up very early on where he's like hey the real freedom is when we get to pose the problems ourselves instead of you know like we're taking a a test where we're trying to meet some criteria for you know standards set by a a scholastic regurgitation of facts that's no longer what Bergson means by the true and the false right you know we 
one of the rules we'll look at, which we'll get to soon, is about applying this criterion to, uh, to problems themselves and no longer solutions. In any case, I will say I'm glad that you like the Bergson book. I think that the other monograph I remember you really liking, but we did it a long time ago, and we did it with our friends over at Acid Horizon, so it's not on our feed, was the, uh, the Proust book that I know you really enjoyed. And maybe it's, there's no, maybe we, we don't even really need to compare Proust and Science as a monograph, even if it kind of is, but you know, yeah. it's a, and you may have noticed that Proust shows up in the book, in I mean, this book. Of course. Yeah, absolutely. This is one of Deleuze's uh, favorite little quotes. It pops up in at least, I would say half a dozen, dozen different places. It'll pop up in a thousand plateaus, for example, where it's, what it's real without being actual, ideal without being abstract. But he also has the other quote from Proust, uh, a little time, a little bit of time in the pure state. So Proust sh shows up a couple times in the book. But in any case, I do want to, before we, we sort of start, since we're, we're just kind of segueing in the intro, do we want to give a shout out just in memory of, of Mary Rudy? I thought about doing that in the intro. But yeah, uh, I mean, this will be out uh, a week or so after her passing. But yeah, we just want to, I suppose, celebrate uh, Mari Rudy, you know, Lacanian thinker. Her and Gail Newman joined us a few months back. Apparently, she was ill at the time, unbeknownst to us. I think I found out a few weeks or maybe a month or so later that she had I was at something like a something, you know, sort of very suddenly and very severe. And so she just recently passed. So yeah, we just want to, you know, share our uh, condolences with, with other folks that knew Mari and celebrate her in the little way that we can. And the based on the little interaction with her that we had the pleasure of, of having. When I spoke with Gail, she said that they have a, another book that's, it's in the process of being reviewed by, uh, you know, the press. And the readers' reviews come in, and they've been really glowing. So we should see another book of their collaboration coming out probably within the next year. So it'd be nice to invite her back on. Yeah, yeah, whenever that, that be... comes to fruition. That's a really lovely idea. I like that. Good suggestion. But I'm glad we got to interact with with her and Gail. I'm glad we we had them on. And you know, it's these things these things happen so suddenly. So it's it's always. Just a good reminder of what, you know, like carpe diem and just go out and, but also remember those who, who make these positive contributions and impacts. Having said that, having gotten the solemn solemnity uh, out of the way, we can jump into the, the discourse on the book. I will say just as a matter of historical precedence, just really quickly, you know, this book came out in 66, so he's gearing up thinking about writing, if not already actively writing Differences of Repetition at this point, you know, his primary thesis for whatever you want to call the the PhD in in France. And you can see some of the themes in this book carry over into the later work, including here and there some interesting aspects that'll show up in an anti-Oedipus, which I share with you, Coop. Even though the word body without organs or word the phrase body without organs doesn't appear in this text, there's a, there are some convergences which aren't important to really go into, but it has to do with these differences in multiplicity. But in any case, you know, it's written in 66. It's for, I believe it was published by, you know, Poof, the, the big university Paris publishing house. And it was for a series that was more or less a kind of, I don't want to say a short introduction to a thinker. We have a series in English now, it's like the very short introduction. You can kind of think of it that way, but it's also meant to not just be an introduction, right? Because it is, you can see Deleuze even says, I think in chapter two, he's like, we're going to assume the reader's already familiar with certain aspects of matter and memory, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's a little bit more than an introduction. It's really meant to kind of present a synthetic view, if you will, um, of a thinker. And that's why I think the first chapter is called Intuition as Method. You know, he's 
Deleuze is, this is one of the ways in which he proceeds to write these monographs, at least by this time, he's kind of gotten a knack for it because this will be his, I believe his fourth kind of full book in this manner. Besides the others we mentioned last week, you know, on Nietzsche and Hume, which were really more of a kind of editorial books, but Nietzsche and philosophy being the second one, the Hume book being the first, I believe the third would be Proust and Signs, which we just mentioned. And so now we've got, we've got Bergsonism. And yeah, I guess I would just want to ask you, I mean, because you were excited, I could tell when you started reading this, you're like, oh, this is, now this speaks to me. Yeah, I mean, just, I'm really glad to hear that, uh, that this one resonated and we can talk a little bit about maybe what excited you before we go into what the structural framework, the five rules that Deleuze lays down for the method of Bergson. There was a nice continuity with the, the Kant book relative to not only, you know, like I mentioned, the critique of dialectical reason or whatever, um, but also he lays out he lays out the conception of difference so well here, like that's yeah. a really big highlight. Obviously, then the time overlap there from those two texts, but obviously matter and memory, that that builds into so much. But one thing that I've kind of I'm kind of gleaning from Deleuze's trajectory is something to do with this fascination with the time image and the movement image and the relationship to cinema and perception and the the constructivist, I guess, active, what is it, the active uh, perceptual apparatus? Or active faculties, rather, sorry. Uh, sorry for mixing oh, up. Oh, I see, I see. There. I don't know if yeah. there's something with, like, the way that maybe, if you're the director of the film or the writer or whatever, if you're the writer, director, that is sort of the opportunities to select the problems that get, right? That's your almost way to state your own does that make sense? Like you're kind of state getting to set forth your problems. For example, the way in which a I mean, this could also this could even it's not quite dogmatic image of thought related per se, but a little bit I, um, to some degree. In terms yeah. of who gets to set the problems, who gets to delineate the problems and their solutions within whatever system you're looking at, I suppose. I take it you're taking determining problems very broadly because yes, this, yes. This yeah, could, yeah, yeah, yeah. This could be ways in which, you know, we could even isolate it to just how one frames a shot, how one right, yeah. be begins, or as you put it on the writer side too, how a narrative begins to be constructed, ways in which time becomes an element that is sort of played and played with. Yeah, I mean, that's... I mean, Deleuze even gets into story. He mentions the storytelling. Let me look at the actual phraseology of it, though. There's something involving storytelling specifically. Only shows up once. And this is on page 108. I must have just breezed past this, but yeah, let's look. Yeah, I'm trying to find a good place Oh, this is on instinct and intelligence. In. Each line of differentiation being exclusive seeks to recapture by its own means the advantages of the other line. Thus, in their separation, instinct and intelligence are such that the one that produces an ersatz of intelligence, the other an equivalent of instinct. This is the storytelling function, virtual instinct, creator of gods, inventor of religions, that is of fictitious representations, right? So literally the film writer or, you know, screenwriter, director, etc. No, this is good. This question of instinct and intelligence is very fascinating and we'll be able to come back to it in our discussion with Ben next week on creative evolution, because Bergson lays out how instinct and intelligence are kind of like the two halves of posing problems and seeking solutions. In fact, it'll be almost like intelligence is able to pose problems that instinct could never do on its own because instinct has these searching functions. It's right. seeking solutions that instinct itself can't find. And so you can kind of see, and I'm paraphrasing obviously, but you can kind of see how they're in this storytelling function of the instinct and intelligence kind of working together. 
Now, just Peace. to clarify, if I remember correctly in the Kant, he says something about instinct, or maybe it was even Hume. It was the Hume book. Our instinct is is the drive to solve problems. I don't know if it's stated that clear that, yeah, that it's straightforward, not quite... but like reason itself for Hume is an instinct. And so reason would be related to this problem solution complex. Right. Although yeah, that's yeah. not exactly the framework within which Deleuze is working in his first book. Because it's interesting, right? Like Deleuze, it's almost a decade between his first and his second book, between empiricism and subjectivity and Nietzsche and philosophy. And so there's a there's a huge amount of development that Deleuze is, is undergoing in this, you know, sometimes it's kind of thought of as this silent decade, although that's kind of unfair for a thinker, right? Because just because one isn't publishing books doesn't mean one isn't doing perhaps some more essential development and teaching and these other things. But yeah, I mean, in the Hume book, it's how reason is not only instinct, but also habit which is another way, an interesting way in which Kant shows up in the Bergson book early on, right? Because even if Bergson thinks that many of the ways in which the critique lays out problems that for Bergson would be badly stated problems, which we'll get to in a second, they both share a kind of interesting relationship that even goes back to Hume. And the way I see it is that reason or intelligence or um, understanding for Hume, you know, just just our intellectual faculties, our own ways of, of reasoning in general. It's from within that that these illusions arise. And the only thing that we can do is sort of try to repress, and that's the word that Deleuze uses, he uses the word refool, that's the psychoanalytic term, repress these illusions, these effects of the illusions that naturally occur within our, um, within our thinking. And so that's, that's an interesting line that brings Hume, Kant, and, and Bergson together. What's interesting, I think, is, and, and maybe we can move to the, the first rule of method in a second, but what's interesting for me with, with Bergson is that if Kant's critiques are, well, I sh maybe I shouldn't say this, but if for Bergson, Kant's critiques are badly stated problems, right? Poorly analyzed mixtures or composites. For Nietzsche, as we'll see in Nietzsche and philosophy, which I assume we'll, we'll get to at some point, for Nietzsche, true critique is the critique of sense and, and values and has to do with sort of the evaluation of who wants truth, right? What is the value of the will in, whether it be the will to truth or the will to posing values in a certain way, which always gets kind of left. For example, who wants the synthetic a priori? Why is that necessary? What is the value of the one who wills this category uh, for our faculties of, of thinking. And so for Nietzsche, that's what critique essentially is. It's essentially a valuation of values. And so for Nietzsche, Kant didn't actually carry out a true critique, right? So like, it's kind of interesting between in the middle, if you, ha if you, if you have Nietzsche in philosophy and then you have the Kant book and now we have the Bergson book, you know, Kant is in the sandwich of thinkers that are actually putting a lot of pressure on the critical transcendental philosophy. He's kind of putting Kant in the vice grip. In any case, first rule, if you would... <laughs> the first rule of Fight Club. The, yeah, the first rule of, of Bergson Club. Apply the test of true and false to problems themselves. Condemn false problems and reconcile truth and creation at the level of problems. One of the things that I remember him, either he says it or I read a, a Bergson quote, or he's probably quoted in Bergsonism. I, maybe I'm, I'm trying to remember having problems differentiating and recollecting, <laughs> which is his own thing. But if I remember, Bergson discovery is, is related to this quest for solutions, 
but it's really the problem that is invented. It's the invention, it's the creation at the level of problems that actually brings something new about, right? Really solutions, you know, once the problem is determined well enough, the solution comes of itself, even if it remains hidden, it just remains to be discovered or uncovered. So invention creation is at the level of problems. And I think it's interesting that, you know, as we saw in what is philosophy, Deleuze runs with this and keeps this in mind when he makes creation, it's creation at the level of concepts that philosophy performs, but concepts are never sort of in a vacuum or, or intellectually masturbatory. They're always in a sort of relation to problems. So creation at the level of problems, at the level of concepts, I think is something we can see Deleuze will never sort of lose sight of. Yeah. So that is interesting. And I mean, I mean, we kind of started off our little chat today by saying it's no longer about a true solution or a correct solution. That's not as interesting because it, because we could always give correct solutions to po problems that we don't ourselves pose that the teacher gives us or the master gives us, you know, to toil away in the field of knowledge, right. You know, yeah. to think of Lacan, that's not the truly creative work. So just real quick to get my Dune shit out of the way early on, um, but it is, yeah. rele it is relevant because I've been kind of obsessing over Dune Messiah, which is kind of relative. It has some resonance here, I think, regarding, you know, time and movement image and um, and stuff like that. But what I think is interesting is like Muad'Dib kind of sets the problems. He sets the problems and he determines by his own actions, by his, he wills the Basically, the whole tragedy of Chani, even though Muad'Dib is, he has access to the future and the past and is, you know, basically superhuman <laughs> in, in, in many ways in terms of ability, cannot save the one that he loves. And he basically sort of follows this path that maximizes his ability to sort of spend time with her. But in that way, there's almost a meta-ness that goes back to this notion of the film director or the writer or the editor, like whoever is determining the narrative structure, right? Whoever that's kind of in a way an analog for a problematics for me, or that's kind of how I'm interpreting this. And I just think that that's very interesting relative to like Muad'Dib is the sovereign, right? That sets the sort of dogmatic <sighs> image of thought. Like we are sort of in his, in his sort of universe, right? And we can, he can manipulate the future based on his actions based on his will but we are stuck at the level of having to work on problems for him right that's maybe taking a leap but i just wanted to throw that out there no, for whatever this, it's worth this is good just for fun if nothing else i mean this is good uh, you know i always think about you know one of the thematics of the quizats hatterack or whatever is this you know attempt to be able to Although via genetics and its own vitalism, as we right, discussed, right. Yeah. science fictionally think of this quote unquote savior or ubermensch that's able to tap into what we could put into the Bergsonian framework of the ontological totality of time. Right. The way in which Deleuze lays it out, perhaps in like chapter three or so, where sort of the past is quote unquote, right? It's it's not it's not that the past was. Bergson will 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 reverse this. The present was because it's always sort of passing in its actualization, whereas yes. the past is and subsists or persists ontologically, sort of in this resonance with with a cosmological time and totality yeah. so there's at least a little bit of an aspect in in dune with that because I, it does feel like time in that sense the past ontologically is and can be accessed through whatever genetic I mean, manipulation that goes to going to matter and memory right um mm -hmm. which is super fascinating but i wanted to mention really quickly with regard to like the critique of pure reason right this goes to maybe the Hume a little bit would be, you know, obviously, if you have someone who has access to all of the data of the past and the future, the ability to, you know, manipulate their own body and like at the cellular and chemical level and the addition or the ability to computate huge 
structures of data. He's more powerful than a supercomputer in terms of, or like these intelligent right. machines, right? So it still goes to this, despite having what one would consider perhaps this type of instrumental reason, right? It's not enough. It's not enough to solve the problem that he's faced with, with regard to his wife's his, death. His, his love, right? Yeah, right. Gotcha. I mean, that's... At some point in one of the books, I'll have to look this up, he says something that there are some problems that don't have solutions. And I'm pretty sure Deleuze also has said this at some point. It would have to... There are obviously, for example, mathematical equations, for example, that don't necessarily have solutions and that becomes its own type of category. So yeah, I mean, I, that does make sense. But this is why you have this other quote right here that he brings up in this section on this, you know, for applying the, the test of the true and the false to problems, this is why, and I think I may have already mentioned it, but the problem has the solution it deserves based on its determination, based on our means and, and ability to determine it, based on even our proclivities to determining problems, because mm -hmm. there could be ways in which we could badly analyze and pose false problems, pose fake problems that... Yeah, kind um, of like the identity politics thing that I posed when we were kind of chatting this morning. A little I mean, bit, yeah, right? you, you brought that up uh, in passing. And so, you know, I, I would give you a chance to to articulate that more. I mean, just in the sense of, I think with regard to the way Deleuze talks about difference here and the way that we confuse the two types of difference, differences between kind and type, and how that leads us to formulate false problems. And so I think that perhaps identity politics is a sort of aspect of that because the diagnosis is sort of based on this this kind of this it's a poor understanding of what difference actually is so it's this kind of false problem that i guess the really the the ultimate problem would be i don't know there's a diversity of needs within society and we can't we can't fulfill all needs within society that every individual has or something like that mm -hmm. and I guess these um, imbruglios we can get, or like these stalemates we can get involved in relative to these perceived differences between groups. To go back to maybe Hume, or I can't remember which conversation it was where we discussed proximity and how, for example, communism being the move to bring the farthest away yeah near to us i think yeah in that's terms of our in terms of our it was what empathy or sympathy i can't our remember partiality our par right. right yeah partiality yeah. but like wasn't he and our uh, sympathy he, extending yeah. our sympathy extending our partiality right exactly yeah. so i think that's kind of what i was how i was looking at it but mm -hmm. i don't know if that really has much resonance i mean you would know better in terms of difference and the problem that because right that's what the whole thing is the critique of like the sort of reactionary critique today is okay multiplicity or like not multiplicity but like pluralism within society is bad mm -hmm. diversity right. weakens us diversity causes conflict but it is within conflict between those problems that generates thought something like that i mean what i what i take you to be I'm, saying i'm grasping a bit I, you're good i mean what i take you to be saying perhaps is related to what you brought up earlier with you know the two types of negation that Deleuze brings up a negation by limitation and a negation by opposition and how Bergson uh, yeah, uh, yeah, fights yeah. against both. I mean, oh, that's good. Very and nice. Bergson brings up, and I think this is part of where Deleuze's affirmationism comes up, obviously from, from Bergson, from, from Nietzsche, you know, who ceaselessly writes about it and uh, other aspects from Spinoza. But in any case, with, with respect to Bergson, you know, there's ways in which identity can be taken and reified as always oppositional rather than intersectional. And I think that that's perhaps where it can lead to a parody of itself and lead to ossifying into these categories that ceaselessly divide where there is more intersection. I mean, so let me throw this out there. Differences in kind, or we see, so with like identity, we diagnose it as differences in type, but it's more about the differences in intensity in a way, or I don't know if that helps contextualize that at all. 
for you or if I'm just kind of grabbing at straws. That's something I'd have to reflect on more and, and we'd have to um, maybe discuss further. I just not exactly sure the, the right entryway into, into this kind of thing. So Gotcha. I mean, that's fine. We have a lot to talk about and I'm yeah, kind of derailing us a bit anyways. I just have to think about it a little bit more. There's, I mean, it's, you know, we don't hear much about identity politics anymore, at least from the right, which, which used to Well, be I mean, their, are you sure? their rallying <laughs> cry. well, I mean, I mean, no, it's, I think that's what it's the not, whole trans. it's not the, fry, it's not the phrasing, right? It's, it's, uh, the phrasing is now just about woke. If woke is an identity, then yeah, it's Yeah, used, but I mean, ultimately, it's used as a cudgel. it's all about difference, right? And it's all about the like the emergence of this as a as a quote unquote problem for society for the reactionary, right? They want exclusive distinctions. Uh, right. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's 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 a procedure by way of exclusive disjunctions, and I mean, this is what you were getting at with diversity in terms Right. of Yeah. Her inclusion, heterogeneity. Exactly. inclusion, yeah, stuff like that. So, I mean, you know, I I do think that in terms of the way in which it's as a rallying cry of dissatisfaction from you know it, it from. The, from what Deleuze and Guattari talk about as the the majoritarian standard of the of the white heterosexual heteronormative adult middle class male anything that's not that is 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 quote unquote woke but that's I mean that's that in itself is a way in which the majoritarian standard is is allowed because of its because of its its fever pitch to and because of media outlets and other things focusing on it to determine the problems when really it's a false problem Yeah, I mean, that the was kind false of my point, really, the is false the falsity of it. the false problem of the false problem of of speaking about all of this in terms of woke wokeness as the enemy is really just another way of reiterating the 14 words what's going to happen to the to the white race and its dominance that's how i kind of read all of these it's just a thinly veiled reiteration of white supremacy that's that's a beat dog hollering so yeah it's a false problem the false But problem I mean, of of why just, do i give a shit about the white race even I though guess, because do I'm, you, because i'm white i you know right, it's I mean, yeah, I see, that's, this is where I just see the difference as he formulates it. The threat is this kind of false difference that isn't a, even a real difference. So it's all automatically setting up the wrong problematic difference can't be integrated back into a totality or whole or something of. Maybe not that, but Right, confusing the the difference in degree of <laughs> let's say my whiteness from a, a difference in kind or yes, something, yes, and trying exa to. exactly, exactly, exactly. But it's also it also gets us back to I mean it's it's really more anti Oedipus than than this question of you know of differences or at least it gets more teeth when we think about as I mentioned exclusive disjunctions or these segregative uses of of the conjunctive syntheses where. You know, I'm of the superior race and I identify with that, which is, again, promoting the majoritarian as that which determines problems and from which the problem is is situated. The center of the, again, the white adore, uh, what the, the white face of Jesus as radiating out waves of sameness and othering from that standard. That itself is a politics of the majority what we used to call the the silent moral majority right and if that is the standard by which problems are determined that in a certain molar politics ensues from that but if a if a minoritarian politics of becoming is allowed to make inroads you're going to have backlash and that's we're giving so much of the attention to the backlash that it kind of ironically or paradoxically reinstitutes it as the the vantage point from which to determine problems which is which is why it's so in, in, insidious and um in any case yeah so the solution we deserve is based on how well we are determining the problems and if what i kind of laid out sort of gels together with with your uh Yeah, yeah, totally. with your question Absolutely. then that that means that the solutions that are available to us or that seemingly are available to us will be determined by that sort of right-wing reactionary Yeah.
in libidinal investment. And I, for one, am, you know, not amenable to that. I, I am opposed to that. But it also brings up, just to get out of identity politics for a second, it kind of vibes with a little bit of what we were talking about with Espen Hammer last week, which is how, for example, climate change is when the privilege is given to whether it be, you know, advocates of capitalism and endless extraction and, and growth, when that is the vantage point from which problems are determined, obviously there are no viable solutions to climate change because that would be opposed to the accumulation of capital, right? right. So this is sort of sim I mean, so basically, I guess to sum it up before moving or perhaps for- I can put a pin on this too, I think as well, once you're done. I'll finish then. Um, it basically gives credence to, or gives a little bit broader application to this notion of the determination of problems, give us the solutions or allow, make possible certain solutions. And those are the ones we deserve based on that determination. So it does have a kind of political underlying aspect and it's not merely a it's not merely a an exercise in thinking that would be abstract. What I think may be the like problematic or the reactionary mind with regard to sexual difference would be something like the goal is to sort of the problem is difference, right? We have to eliminate sexual difference. We have so we're gonna remove anything that references sexuality, like sexual difference is a threat. That's the way that we they formulate the problem is this. We have to stop difference. We have to create a homogenous. We have to stop difference from the heteronormative principle. Sure. It's yeah. it's, it's yeah. we have to reinstate the norm. Anything that that would. This is why, you know, pride is every year. There's always this discourse about, you know, gay pride where it's and Ben Shapiro put it in a way that I think you know, as asinine as, as inane as he may be, he put it in a way that I think tries to resonate with traditional conservative principles, which mm -hmm. is about how, oh, they can go be, be gay in, in a corner, but giving them any spotlight recognition, any sort of dissemination in media, any representation at all, it fight goes against the, what, Judeo-Christian heteronormative principles. So it's it's the norms that he's worried about. And I think articulating in, in that way is is helpful for reminding us, or at least for contextualizing, I guess, what you mean by sexual difference in that sense, right? Difference from divergence from a yeah. presupposed standard for ways in which humans and society should be structured around. So, yeah. so I mean, so. I think you had it right with what was it? Uh, exclusive disjunction or I might have fucked that right. up. Right. No, I mean, you did. You, I mean, you. This is just kind of like another way of stating that same statement. I think, or like, right, digging into that, what that means, really, in the specific, I suppose. But that's all I had. As no, far it's, as that goes, it's good. So, I mean, yeah, it's um. So reinstating the norm would be reinstating the the means by which we determine problems, the problems of of human sociality and organization, right, and whether or not because. And this is the only little thing I'll say about this, because when when the phrase gets overused to the point of no meaning of grooming, we allow for all manners of heteronormative grooming that is allowed representations of heteronormative sexuality is the presupposed manner in which society should be inundated by images of of grooming. And that is that is the acceptable way in which these norms are reinforced and we presuppose them and that's the majoritarian type of standard. So any deviation from that norm is then that's grooming as it's being overused. That's bad because that gives credence to the fact that there is merit in determining problems of sexuality otherwise than heteronormatively. Which is itself a false problem, right? Because we're all sort of you know, if you want to go to Freud in this idea of a bi of a constitutive bisexuality or a polymorphous perversity, right? Yeah. Or Lacan, the problem of sex, because that ultimately is that's kind of a problem that maybe 
at least for Lacan, might not quite have a solution per se. This is getting a bit speculative. I, I do apologize if I no, put you on an if, island there, but I don't, just a random thought. I mean, I think Lacan doesn't necessarily propose solutions, but tries to determine the problem in various rigorous ways, including to the point of using like Fragian logic and, or, you know, these Aristotelian symbolic logic to discuss the constitutive lacks around which we sort of organize our positions qua masculine, feminine. And as you said, that's not conservative mind. We would definitely want to make that exclusive and make us wear that on our, our face and make us have to identify with a pre-given sort of biological basis, so to speak, so-called biological basis. But in any case, that's again a way of trying to trying to have the power to determine problems or predetermine the problems, bake the solution into the problem as it's determined and as it quote unquote should be determined, which is a libidinal investment in a type of society and not a universal. That's what they would want to posit is that there is a universal a given, solution and a given sexuality, a, a given determination of the problems because it's, I mean, they the biology. They, I mean, that's what they go to is biology, which is why I think that even Bergson here is so interesting because he critiques this notion of what is it, evolutionism, as this kind of linear process, right? Yes, of negation or like the mechanism being negation. Whereas, which goes to something interesting that I brought up a few times, and it's been a quite a while, but I think it goes back to machinic unconscious episodes where I was talking about these competing ideas of how evolution works. So you have notions of what's called phyletic gradualism, which would be this sort of linear negative process and, you know, back and forth or whatever versus phyletic, okay, no, phyletic gradualism. And then you have a uh, punctuated equilibrium. Punctuated equilibrium, as it sounds like, is where there's a stability and then there's a, a change comes out of, it almost comes out of nowhere. <laughs> well, in a very undetermined way, like it's less... The idea ultimately being that evolution as this process of linear negation is a false way to or is a shitty way to look at the problem or something like that. Whereas this punctuated equilibrium is a more in line with how evolution actually functions in this more differential capacity or something like that. Again, speculating a bit. In this section on the first rule that we've been talking about, right, apply the criteria of truth and false to, uh, to, to problems and the creation of problems. You know, he brings up Marx's formulation and ties it in with Bergson. Humanity only sets itself problems that it's capable of solving. Bergson saying the truly great problems are set forth only when they are solved, which means the way that Deleuze is reading it, both of these phrases, Marx's and Bergson's, should be thought of in terms of determining the problems. Determining the problems gives us the solutions we deserve. And to go to biology, which you just brought up, at the end of that paragraph, the list says, it is true that in Bergson, the very notion of the problem has its roots beyond history in life itself or in the Elan Vital. Life is essentially determined in the act of avoiding obstacles, stating and solving a problem, the construction of the organism is both the stating of a problem and a solution. So, you know, I do think that that's interesting because we went from the political sort of to the metaphysical back to the down to the biological and you can kind of tie it all together there. But as you have here, there's a complementary rule. This is why Deleuze says there's three or five rules. So we had the first rule and there's a complement or corollary to, to the first rule. False problems are of two sorts, non-existent problems defined as problems whose very terms contain a confusion of the more and the less, and badly stated questions so defined because their terms represent badly analyzed composites. Yeah, I mean, this is interesting. We talked a little bit about badly stated problems or questions, false problems, and the more and the less, though, is, is really interesting to me. And you've already stated it. I guess that goes to intensity, right? Even if Deleuze will obviously revive and retain and re-articulate intensity in, for example, Diff's repetition, and as I said later, with A Thousand Plateaus, he's going to want to differentiate the, not, the denumerable, which is always related to extended multiplicities, which can be divided without 
changing their nature, right, to, which are metric or something like this, with the non-metric or the non-denumerable multiplicities, which are intensive. So he'll definitely take intensity in a way differently from Bergson, because I think for Bergson, the problem with at least overusing intensity or using intensity in such a way that as though it could determine problems is the fact that intensity, as we know, is a matter of degree. And so it falls into the more and the less, I think, for Bergson, at least in general. I just wanted to make a little distinction between Bergson and Deleuze, because sometimes, you know, it's easy. Yeah, oh, no, total. I'm glad you did, because I was uh, like, not catching that either. With Bergson, yeah, the more and the less would be a question of difference in degree, which he wants to radically distinguish from differences in kind, or in the French, it's difference in nature. I think that's kind of interesting to think about, that there's, huh. a, there's a kind of... This is what the, why Bergson, when he talks about intuition as method, wants us to be able to go down to what he calls the natural articulations, the difference in nature, the difference in kind, the natural articulations being, what, as we'll see later, on the side of duration, Whereas space would be, uh, or extensity would be the realm of differences in, in degree, right? So like distance would be relative to space, right? Because that's like, how far am I away from you? Am I one right. inch from you or am I one mile from you? Right. That's mm -hmm. an intensive relationship, I suppose. Intensive if... There's ways in which distance can be non-metric and, and so intensive, where we talk about the distance, the height, for example. My fall from 10 meters is not half as oh, dangerous right, right. as from ah, 20 yeah, meters. Yeah. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Right, so there's, there, there are these yeah, different interesting. Interesting criteria, but we can, we can convert um, sort of a non-metric, if you want, distance to a metric distance if we make it just about our latitude and longitude, mm -hmm. or just about length, if you will. If we bring in altitude, it becomes kind of interesting, right? Because, you know, there's, but in any case, that was just a, an interesting example that we talked about a little bit with, um, with Dan Smith a few weeks ago. Yeah, so the more and the less, I mean, for, for the most part, the way that Bergson is thinking about this in terms of when he puts on one side spaces where we have differences of degree, whereas in duration, we have differences of kind. And one of the reasons why we have differences of kind and duration is because a thing doesn't, isn't distinguished from itself and from everything else in space, not essentially, but in time, it differs from itself and from, from everything else. And... I mean, I don't get. I don't of, get the first half. I do. The second half makes sense. Well, a thing differs from itself in time because to use a Hegelian. Well, I mean, word, I, I understand the thing differencing from itself in time, but I don't. I guess the first part was about space and how. Yeah, because how are things? Well, a thing wouldn't be different from itself in another in another space. If I move the TV. Oh yeah, five, okay. Five feet you. over, or something like this. I know that's a banal example, but no, this... that's. A, I'm glad that's perfect. Actually, I'm glad you said something <clears throat> so easy. To... It may differ relative to other things in the room, for example, but doesn't differ from itself. I forget which book, if it was Hume or whatever, but that we would even consider the is the same thing. We kind of attach this continuity to things, which seems kind of like a false falsity. Am I really the same if I'm, I mean, this could even go to the fucking example of Caesar and his concept and crossing the Rubicon to some degree, I think. Uh, the concept of Caesar, the concept of crossing the Rubicon being inherent analytically to Caesar's person as Leibniz sees it. Yeah. Right. right? Because, I mean, you know, I mean, we're all, that's dealing with perhaps space and duration I think it would be no. I mean, okay, but crossing the Rubicon spatially is not the important thing, right? In terms of the event, it has to do with yeah. a whole series and a whole series Other of remarkable outside. and ordinary points for for Leibniz, and it's the seriality itself that is what Deleuze is trying to highlight, and it's the seriality that implies a series of events temporally. But the Rubicon is just kind of an arbitrary, that's just the celebrated mark. It's not, you know, in terms of Yeah, it sort of has space, no real content. It's, a, it's more of a space-time 
determination then then it is merely a spatial determination right because absent from... yeah when, when does he cross it's not just crossing it's when and in what context given all these other social relations or historical developments etc yeah there, history, I was, maybe just to i was gonna say there's a there's a kind of a, a rough definition that hegel gives of time where he conceives it as the movement of abstract negativity Right. Yeah. And Every minute negates the present or past or some shit like that. The movement of abstract negativity would be how each thing differs from itself in duration. Right. That's basically how Bergson's doing it because he actually gives an affirmative <laughs> definition rather than using negativity in this way. But in any case, yeah. So the problems of the more and the less, one of them, one of the ones that I love is. Well, the three examples he gives, but we'll focus on one of them, is uh, disorder and order, being and nothing, the real and the possible. And, you know, one of the things we could we, that I focus on, the, the example that I always think of is like, and it reminds me a little bit of, of, of Heidegger, but I won't. It's when the hammer doesn't work. It's when a tool doesn't work. It's when our equipment starts to fail that it actually causes us to think rather than to be pre-ontologically oriented in the world and doing shit without having to focus on it. It's when I turn my, my car key and I realize my battery's dead, that I'm like, that, right. that a problem yeah. occurs, that something takes me out of my everyday mode of existence. So Bergson says the same thing, that we start to have these problems, for example, with being and nothing, when we think that nothing is less than being, when in fact, Nothing yeah. is more than being, right? Exactly. Um, because nothing has infinite potential. Nothing is being plus negation plus the psychological motive for calling my attention, right? Yeah, that right. My engine, my engine block's not turning over when I'm turning the key. That yeah. nothingness brings me out, forces me to encounter a problem. What the fuck happened? Did I leave my lights on? You know, was my battery stolen? Yeah. I mean, who knows, right? But that's... We don't have access to water. How do we uh, accumulate water for life, etc.? These questions of the more and the less, then he does the same thing with disorder, where, you know, it's where order is really, where disorder is really just another configuration of order that we didn't expect, right? So there are some of these psychological motivations for and expectations, right? I expected my, my car to work. It didn't. That psychological motive is one of the additions, but also the, you know, being plus negation plus motivation. This is more, quote unquote, and Bergson, I think, is using this loosely because he doesn't really buy into this because he thinks it's these are false ways of stating problems. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can see, I mean, we in our discussion with Stephen Holgate and, and Deleuze reproduces some of this language, you know, that starting with being and nothing and sort of converging them, crossing them together and fading them into one another, like the science of logic begins with in order to come out with becoming. For Deleuze, for Bergson, this type of way of thinking is to move in these kind of abstract categories that can't, that don't really have the kind of concreteness with which they're endowed linguistically. Now, on the one hand, as we enjoy talking with, with Stephen, that movement, that speculative movement is in and of itself fascinating for a certain type of philosophy, but perhaps on our reading of Bergsonism, one might say that one can only lead to non-existent or badly posed problems because these are, these are badly badly analyzed composites or the word in French is mixtures. These are mixtures that are all mixed up. And for example, we're mixing up differences in degree and taking them for differences in kind and not analyzing them out, sifting them out. This is why also Bergson thinks that perception is actually less than the object out there. It's the object that interests me minus everything else insignificant. And perception literally means that. Perception is a kind of grasping, but we grasp by like sifting. We sift out that which is not interesting. We sift out the remarkable from the ordinary 
Well, isn't the wouldn't the sifting be the a negation? The sifting sifting out. I now, but the but the affirmation is what interests me, right? I'm not negating everything around it. I'm just ignoring it. It's a little bit different, right? Because it's okay, not that gotcha. I negate the context. It's merely that uh, it's kind of the same way with the. Uh, the different manners in which philosophy, science, and art sift out chaos in order to create consistency, or whether it be film, through concepts right? or function. Yes, exactly. Right. So you're not necessarily negating by doing a, a close up on a face or something, right? You know. Um, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And this is the same reason why a lot of those posts were roasted on Twitter in the past few weeks, which is like, hey. We use this AI to see to zoom out and see what's what's outside of the frame of the Mona Lisa. It's fun for food for thought for imaginative, you know, speculative play. I'll say I'll just call it play. But in terms of its artistic value, that's questionable at least. I was thinking about this. Ironically, think about evolution maybe relative to. I'm going to do my best to explain this. So we don't see the sort of latent difference within whatever being or object that we observe. This also is interesting in the context of the dialectic, right? Because being and nothing already sort of contain one another. So I guess the way I would try to state it plainly would be like yeah we can't see the difference in the organism let's say relative to we don't see the rel the potential difference within that's contained within the organism which could go back to body without organs right we can't see what potential differences there are we don't have access to those it's only whenever it's actualized within the world that we can perceive i don't know <laughs> i might cut that out but to kind of get what I'm saying, or can I, do I need to elaborate a bit further for this okay. to make more sense? It's think, almost kind of like Freud too. Like Freud's method is similar, right? Because we, as the individual, we can't see our latent unconscious content, even though we, ex we're like, obviously in terms of proximity to it, that proximity to our own, whatever our own conscious and unconsciousness doesn't help us. Right content that we need to understand our own symptom or something like that is not legible to us in the same way that the potential difference within an organism right within evolution right we can't tell what's going to happen a fish becomes eventually they emerge from the waters and then mm. there's mammals mm. right etc if you looked at a fish the ancestor of a fish or something mm. like that then you wouldn't see its potential difference as a fucking monkey or a you don't have access to the, I don't know if that's the real or like noumena or even something else, but do right. you kind of get what I'm saying? Like you, well, you, you don't you perceive would potentials. You, you would have to be able to see and predict or at least imagine the evolution in the, in the biomes, in the milieus into which those forms of life could possibly interact with. Based on the aquatic milieu, the primordial aquatic milieu, yes, you know, so you, you do need to, um, you know, just on the organism itself, I think that you could obviously extrapolate and speculate in it existing in space or whatnot, given yeah. the proper, whatever the fuck, given humans and technology, but you can't, to take into the account of the... I mean, this is very similar to your example of those AI-generated... Uh, right like context right. right right exactly do you want to move to the third yeah the, the, second, the second rule, rule <laughs> i mean third in order if we consider the complementary we mentioned this a little bit about the this is one thing where Deleuze sees bergson and, and kant having some overlap so we're not going to yeah. spend as much time on this because i i, kind I mean of, i think we kind of already have gone right, right. But this struggle against illusion, rediscover the true differences of kind or articulations of the real. The natural articulations that I brought up earlier, right? Yeah, I just brought up that, you know, for Kant and Bergson, they both think that these illusions are inevitable. It's, 
you know, reality is what it is. If you want to say it this way, that we are bombarded with these mixtures, with these composites, whether it be perception and recollection, for example, which is something that Deleuze will want to take up and different repetition. When oh, he yeah, yeah. When I he would really like that, too. When he, when he critiques recognition, for example, as a mode of thinking, for, for Deleuze, recognition presupposes identity in the concept rather than actually welcoming difference and therefore is not, or resemblance, analogy, opposition, these categories that Deleuze sees as over-determining, over-coding difference at every step of the way, including and in going up to tracing problems from solutions. This is a method that Aristotle himself will do where he thinks that the question is merely taking a declarative statement and putting a, you know, you know, changing the inflection of the voice, right? You know, for Deleuze, this method of, of tracing problems for solutions, again, gives up our, um, our ability to determine problems, which obviously is the first rule and gives up our power, our freedom. But here, illusion, I think, is merely the fact that we are we are always bombarded with these these mixtures, these mixtures of difference of degree and difference of kind. And that's why he gives the example of the the good psychologists, so to speak, understands that perception and recollection are sort of mixed together. And the part of determining the problem or part of analyzing a part of performing a or a part of having a well analyzed mixture rather than a badly analyzed one would be being able to separate out perception and, and recollection. So in order to make them to converge again, right? This is the constant move we, we see with with the Luz. We saw this in the comp book where you began by the singularities of the faculties and the two senses, and then you converge them. You know, so you begin by sifting out, then you then you connect. And that's how you form these rhizomes, these networks. That's how you build multiplicities. Just to make sure that I'm okay. My interpretation or read on it was about this distinguish is the distinguishing between recollection and perception, because we wrongly think that they're the same. Or we, we, we which makes to, sense. I mean, we fail to sift. We, we fail to sift them out, right? I mean, like well, we fail to sift out how. Recollection I th- I is, think... is always assisting perception, so we fail to sift out yeah, yeah. that assistance. Okay, um, you know when we that almost goes to where we're ignoring. Yeah, we ignore the recollection aspect of perception. Well, this was the discussion we had with Dan towards the end of our last conversation, where Dan is kind of saying for Deleuze the way that he reads him, the way that he sees him, which I think is very provocative. You know novelty is constantly occurring right at every moment and yeah. the problem is sort of getting ourselves out of the everyday mode of thinking where we recognize things where there are, are encounters right where where we we see in the repetition some sort of clothed repetition where there where differences are not you know esteemed as valuable for novelty, but we, we think we see the same old things. We think we recognize the same old things in the same situations. Mm-hmm. And so how is it that we constantly are believing to encounter the old when in fact we're the, we're the encountering the, the, new. the new? So that's where recollection, assisting perception can create these inherent illusions to our, to our reason, to our intelligence uh, or in- Intellect, as Bergson calls it, right? So this is where Kant and Bergson are very close, that we have to, and I believe, let me look again. I said this earlier, but, you know, Deleuze says, he treats the illusion in a way similar to Kant, speaking of Bergson. The illusion is based in the deepest part of the intelligence. It is not, strictly speaking, dispelled or dispellable. Rather, it can only be repressed. We tend to think in terms of more or less, that is to see differences of degree, whether it's a kind, we can only react against this intellectual tendency by bringing to life again in the intelligence, another tendency, which is critical. Speaking of critique, right? This is kind of interesting that he's yeah. thinking of critique for Bergson, even if Bergson, 
even if for Deleuze, Bergson's going to go to the conditions of real existence through intuition, which is a different intuition than Kant, right? It's the mm-hmm. same word, but you know, Kant's type of intuition is this passive reception of sensations. And I don't think necessarily uh, Bergson is, uses that dualism as easily of this passive active where intelligence divided into understanding, reason, imagination would be active and mm-hmm. we would have just this receptive faculty of the sensation. I don't, I'm not sure if that Bergson would agree with that, but Deleuze doesn't really say anything about that here. Yeah. That would be something left to speculate on, but you know, we can imagine as this, the end of this just to make sure that I have this recollection and perception are different faculties or processes or something like that. But now they do work in combination. Yeah. The, 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 because, the language like I said, is that recollection assists perception. In my reading, I was, I assumed before actually even up until reading this book, I hadn't really interrogated the notion that recollection and perception could even be different processes in themselves because that's not sort of legible to me, I suppose. Well, if, if, in okay, a way, so, right? so, so if they interpenetrate each other, right, this is why we need to sift it out. I mean, it doesn't it, really do it. What does it do to me to know other than it helps? All right. Now, being aware of the difference helps me generate better problems, I suppose. So mm-hmm. that's the use value <laughs> of this distinction. Here's a quote. In short, representation in general is divided into two directions that differ in kind, into two pure presences that do not allow themselves to be represented, that of perception, which puts us at once into matter, and that of memory, which puts us at once into the mind. The question is not whether the two lines meet and mix together. The mixture is our experience itself, our representation, but our false problems derive from the fact that we do not know how to go beyond experience towards the condition of experience, towards the articulations of the real and rediscover what differs in kind and the mixtures that are given to us and on which we live. It's kind of like, this is part of the way I think about it. And it's, it's probably a little sloppy, but you know, you can imagine if recollection is, you know, this aspect of sifting through the virtual ontological sort of matrix of the past, which as I said earlier is, and you know perception is we could say kind of is this movement of you know interacting putting me in matter as bergson says right yeah. that's where the two are assisting each other to formulate images that are useful for me it's kind of like long term storage with a hard drive and present storage or like I don't even know how to, what the word would be for that, but like random access memory, right? RAM at a computer, it's housing the, whatever application is running at the time in a virtual space at that point. But then you, so you have that, and then you also have recollection would be kind of analogous to the hard drive versus perception would be ran, like RAM at, on a computer because it's sort of, yeah. I don't think for Bergson that would work though. I mean, because what that- Well, yeah, because he said that, I mean, I was going to go to that because I think he problematizes like, memory yes period rel- relative to matter but i think that's an interesting question so this has got me on the train of thought of thinking about okay i really want to understand how information is stored period and how it's accessed and reproduced or what the fuck is going on there in terms of even something i don't know ontology ontology or or what have you because i think we are sort of trying to, it's almost an artificial i don't know there's some type of similarity in this way that our own perception and recollection interact. Now you need both, right? There's an integration between both to make the system run because you have to have a certain like, right? There's kind of like a base substrate layer of um, necessity. Bergson's not going to want to endorse a a notion of a, say like a drawer in the brain. Right, yes, yeah. No, totally. Where I, I get that. We, I totally we get sift that. Through. So yeah, yeah. If if there if if you can use the RAM memory aspect that you were just bringing up, the hard drive RAM stuff, it would be it would be ontological. It would not be psychological. That's the difficult thing I think for us is because yeah. our everyday way of thinking about this is that we have these memories 
in the brain. Yeah, right. And Bergson makes that totally, makes that, totally problematizes it, that because it'd also be like, I apologize in advance. No, for you're this, good, but man. Like, to where a goal of memory is stored? Because Dune, right? It's all about genetic memory, but the Golas can somehow access their prior memories too through this process of uh, encountering a trauma. So the it's kind of like this old school, you know, shittily formulated problem of where memory is stored. It's f stored in like, you know, it's easy to think it's stored in a physical location or whatever, mm -hmm. but it's really this virtuality. Yes. Which is real nonetheless, I think is it, the, yes. is a good to bring up, right? It's stored in the balls. <laughs> exactly. No, it's stored in what, I mean, this is the ontological aspect. It, the past is what Deleuze calls being in itself. And I think we have to think that as, as a kind of Hegelian, but it's through that virtual access of recollection that it can provide images for us that can kind of become for us. And that's, that's the repetition for itself of Deleuze's difference repetition part. But yeah, this is all very good. Okay. So the second complementary rule, the real is not only that which is cut out according to natural articulations or differences in kind, it is also that which intersects again along paths converging towards the same ideal or virtual point. I think that that's actually what we've kind of been talking about mm -hmm. with this question of, of access. And there's the very famous picture of the cone and it's a cone that's sitting on its point, right? Uh, and the points on a plane. And that's the present, which is the most contracted aspect of the past, which mm -hmm. I think is an interesting way yeah. of thinking about it. And it, it kind of funnels out, right? And we, we have to expand or contract based on the regions of being we're trying to access. It's all almost very, it becomes almost, almost mystical if we think about it this way. But I don't think it's any more mystical than thinking we have yeah, like the we have, physical. We whatever. have stuff in the yeah. brain. We have a drawer in the brain that we that we reach out and and grab something. Yeah, like we've got um, a we've got a like a Victrola in our head that run the LP back or whatever you know, right. drop the needle, etc. Right. Just thinking how interesting this is in the context of like Memento, the film, right? Yeah, because obviously, because uh, this kind of goes to my computer analogy. He's got an external right. He has his long-term memory so he knows who he is all that stuff up to a certain point in time and that's kind of almost what i was getting at as far as like this certain like minimum level of uh i don't know information that we need to function as an organism but then he's lost his ability his ability to generate new memories what does that mean for him as a being you know i know that's a really interesting question we don't necessarily have to go into that but i just wanted to raise that briefly I don't want to derail us too much unless that, you know, strikes a fancy of yours. It's hard to delve into <laughs> that movie without a, a more elaborate, you know, sort of rumination, but it's, it's definitely. Well, I worse. mean, he, I mean, he actively creates a fantasy for himself, right. With his signs, the appearances. So it's interesting in that way, I think. Because he does the tattoos and he purposefully misleads himself, creating this fictional experience for him to, because his perceptual apparatus is mistaken, right? Like it's all about mistake and relative to problems. He feeds himself a problem that he can't quite really ever solve at the end of the film, right? Because it's all about the making his diagnosis general enough to fit his world whatever world he encounters you know he's not able to to analyze the the differences in degree and differences in kind right he's not able to read his own signs they become hieroglyphs to a certain extent to himself yeah exactly and who is sammy jenkins is like negating his own whatever but third rule state problems and solve them in terms of time rather than of space this is another one we've kind of already talked about, but I in passing mentioned that this is where Bergson will put differences in degree on the side of space and differences in kind on the side of time or duration. Since we don't really have to go over that again, but at least it gives us 
means for which to go back and think about the very first one, which is apply the criterion of, of true and false to problems. It's precisely in stating problems and solving them in terms of time rather than space goes back and, and connects back up with that first rule of applying the true and the false to problems mix, uh, uh, you know, analyzing the mixtures. Well, also goes back to this, if we're able to pose problems with respect to time. Now I will say one thing I'll be quick because this is stuff we haven't read together before, but if we look at difference of repetition, if we look at the way in which he thinks through differentiation with a T and a C, right? Thinks through even notions of the event. It's not at all clear that Deleuze is going to hold to this third rule himself and make it a part of his own method. If we even go all the way to what is philosophy, which we talked a little bit about, when he's thinking of the history of philosophy and the superposition of planes of eminence, that itself is a kind of spatial thinking and understanding. So it's not quite certain that Deleuze is going to hold to this notion that differences in degree are always and only spatial. I don't necessarily think that he holds on to this and that differences in kind, I don't think for Deleuze, they're only temporal durational. I do think he's going to complicate that himself for his own method. So it's just something to think about and keep in mind um, for the future. But it is at least instructive for this reading of Bergson and kind of gives us a little bit of leeway for understanding these kind of things. And to the and it also gives us ways of beginning with this dualism that Deleuze talks about, this kind of generalized dualism that moves to a monism. Yeah, this was confusing to me, so I'm glad you... Well, I mean, think about... What was one of the quotes I just read? One of the things he'll talk about is, for example, like matter and duration, you know, how, how matter is just a kind of diffuse, expanded duration, or sorry, I'd have to look at how, how he's phrasing it, but you can see the ways in which he, he'll do this, where he'll, this is again, the method where you singularize and then you connect, you singularize these heterogeneous elements to converge them again right you diverge to converge the you know duration will be like the most diffuse matter whereas there you go memory is essentially difference in matter essentially repetition this would be something that i think since we we merely talked about intuition as method right intuition as a as a way of interacting with duration and and use our own durations in order to interact with or sort of in order to resonate with and be able to be informed by durations that are inferior and superior to us in human and superhuman durations you know if intuition is the method the question of dualism and monism i think is one that would take you know, a whole nother episode, a whole other question. But I do think that Deleuze is interested in how these different dualisms, matter and memory, for example, how they converge in a virtual point, mm -hmm. right? And sort of end up, this is where memory has an essentially ontological domain of, of search. And it's only the actualization of memory that has a psychological aspect. It's our sort of, you know, contracting or expanding throughout that ontological domain. It's the actualization of the image that becomes useful for me. That's the psychological part. But memory itself being ontological and this cosmological ontology, that's where the dualism breaks down at least on the initial side. I mean, because he will say that it becomes this generalized, you know, this restricted pluralism, this generalized pluralism that goes into a, a different a dualism on the other side that's not the same as it was before. What Deleuze will say in a, in a Thousand Plateaus, it's in the Rhizome chapter or introduction, if you want, where he says, 
the formula they seek is pluralism equals mono, monism. So they say, arrive at the magic formula we all seek. Pluralism equals monism. Via all the dualisms that are the enemy, an entirely necessary enemy, the furniture we are forever rearranging. That's already inherent and inspired in these closing chapters of Bergsonism, where he's kind of thinking through how dualism becomes monism, becomes pluralism, right? And um, you can see the dualisms they do in A Thousand Plateaus, white wall, black hole, smooth, striated, the nomadic, the sedentary, refrain, chaos, matter and expression, which they get from Helmsliff. But there will also be intervening terms that help to negotiate those dualisms and sometimes break them down. But a lot of the times what they do, again, these dualisms are meant to, you know, singularize these heterogeneous multiplicities, converge them together, and then diverge them beyond a, a virtual point. This is the method. This is kind of the differential method that he ascribes to Bergson. You could say he describes ascribes to himself because it's extending the curve but one differentiates so as to integrate. That's the mathematical movement that he's of the calculus that he's thinking about. And now, is this a lot of stuff that you had gleaned in your translation of the Chernievsky book on Deleuze's method? Or just other, like specifically, or just... In terms of the method as singularization and of heterogeneous elements and the connection, that's definitely Chernievsky's way of reading the Kant and the Bergson book specifically that those two give, they give us indications for Deleuze's own method because Deleuze himself, even if he talks about method in other writers, because he'll talk about Nietzsche's method, he'll talk about intuition as method, he talks about the transcendental method of Kant, but it's, it's the way in which he writes the books, it's the way in which he's writing about method in other works and the only few times he talks about his own method, specifically with Watery, is like in the dialogues. It's very rare when he says he'll say anything about his own method. He talks about in the dialogues a kind of pickup method. It's not about an idea being true or correct. It's about sort of taking an idea and applying it outside of its domain into these different domains. You know, that's. I mean, that's one of the ways that he thinks about his quote unquote method, but that's not itself a theory of his method. And he doesn't have one. Mm -hmm. He doesn't, he has a whole theory of concepts and a whole theory of what philosophy does, but he doesn't have a, he doesn't have a theory of the method, if you will, like a meta theory of, of his writing, of his philosophy, except as system or metaphysics, et cetera. But these are all general statements. They're not methodological. And so that's kind of the merit of Chernyovsky's book is to extend beyond this virtual point that Deleuze has left as a problem to be determined. What is the, if we can more or less articulate elements or aspects of Deleuze's ontology, which I think is, he gives us a lot to work with in terms of the method, we have to kind of see what he does in the monographs and then see after that, once we have a, a theory of the concept and a theory of method and the theory of the elements that go along with the concept, like, like the plane of eminence, like the conceptual personae, once we have that in, in mind, then we have to go back and see how those two interact with how Deleuze himself engages the history of philosophy. Because the history of philosophy itself becomes something different within Deleuze. And he breaks away from the, the tradition in a certain way. So it's kind of hard to say that there is any one history of philosophy, obviously, in that sense. It's the subterranean canon kind of rising up. Here's a question for you. This is going to be out of nowhere, but do you think that Deleuze kind of gestures towards a non-philosophy in this book? Especially, I think, maybe towards the end of the book. I don't know that I picked a bit of the text, so I can cut this out if kind of a random question, but this could be something that maybe Laura Roel would pick up from Deleuze or like as an inspiration point. Hmm, I didn't think about that, but I did just see one of the things you pointed out that you thought was interesting where 
and we don't have time to talk about this, obviously, but where <laughs> Deleuze goes through Bergson's duration and simultaneity book, where which engages extensively with theory of relativity and Einstein, and comes out that Bergson, you know, almost paradoxically thinks that Einstein's theory of relativity actually proves something that it's not known for, which is that time is singular, is one rather than what it may come across as signifying, which is that it's there's multiple times, there's multiple systems of references, and that being is one. Now, whether that's important, the time is one is important for understanding Bergson. Whether or not being is one, I think is that's important for understanding Deleuze because yeah. of his theory of univocity. Right. Being I was going to ask said, about univocity and bivocity of being. Right. Being is said in, in one and the same sense of all that it is said, blah, 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 blah. He's not going to want to say there's one mode of there's being for a plant, but the being for God is said in a different sense, right? He's not going to want to, he has, he has all kinds of reasons for this. We talked a little bit with Vern and why that's important. And it's in the very difficult first chapter of this repetition, but it's, it's important. I think because the what's sometimes called as like the horizontal or flat ontology of Deleuze, at least in this sense, I think is essential for thinking difference for Deleuze. Because if being were said in several senses and we had a sort of strange peaks and valleys or let's say plateaus in ontology. I think that that itself would predetermine difference. That itself would, would make difference subordinate to sort of predetermined by the difference between the creator and the created. Then we would be doing a theology, right? So it kind of is, is a way of carrying on Heidegger's critique of onto theology, but obviously taking it in different avenues, using different, a different history of philosophy, using different concepts, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not quite sure if Deleuze himself would, he wouldn't necessarily put as much stock into ontico ontological difference, right? That's not quite his categorization, where there would be beings with a little B and being with a capital B. I think Deleuze, like Simon Dunn, likes to use one and the same word for either and complicate that notion covered a lot even if we didn't cover a lot of like pages i think i think delving into the the opening chapter and some of our excursions were pretty good today we'll leave it the open question where where gola memories are stored <laughs> for, for, for next time brother uh and that will wrap up this week's edition of the Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins.